You can now follow me on all my social media platforms to find out who my latest guest will be. And don't forget to click the subscribe button and the notifications bell so you're notified for when my next podcast goes live. And boom, we're on. And today's guest, we've got Hector Bravo. Hector, how are we? Good, how about yourself, man? Ah, really good, mate. It's good to cool. see you. Likewise. Served in Iraq. You ended up in the prison system for nearly 16 years as well. Was a prison officer working in some of the roughest and most dangerous prisons in America. You exposed a lot of stuff as well. But first and foremost, it's good to see you. Likewise, man. But before we get into everything, I always like to go back to the start with my guests. Get a bit of understanding about you, where you grew up, how it all began. Okay, so I grew up in Brawley, California. It's Southern California, the lowest, most part of the border of Mexico. Mm -hmm. um, small town, right? Everybody knows everybody right there. And you, you really got to get out of that little town or you're going to be stuck there. Um, that's when I decided to join the army. And I joined the army at 17. Really? What, what were you like at school? Um, like barely passing very very um like rebellious what about family life my parents were around siblings it was cool um, nice area where you grew up yeah, i was nice not poor not rich middle what was the decision to join the army i i needed a plan i needed to leave and then 9 11 happened the twin towers went down that motivated motivated me and a lot of people to join how was that seeing that 9 11 attacks? I was 16, 17 <clears throat> years old. At the time, it felt like an attack on our home soil. It, it, it angered It angered me. At such a young age. So that was a real, that was a catalyst for you to then join the army? Perfect age, perfect timing, and direction. Were you scared? Yeah. <laughs> Scared of the unknown, man. Scared of not knowing um, what you expect. I never left home like that before. What's the process to get into the army in America? You have to go through a physical examination, get naked in front of doctors, show them your hands, duck walk, and do all kinds of weird things. And um, aside from that is... Uh, I was 17 years old. I was underage. My parents had to sign a permission slip for me to join. Mm -hmm. What was the training like? Intense. 2002, Fort Benning, Georgia, infantry. 16 weeks of uh, learning how to kill. So what are you using then? Are you using rifles and... M M16 rifles, grenades, machine guns bayonets the knives um hand to hand combat grappling all, all of the above how many people in a platoon uh, roughly around 30 give or take but uh, overall there was a lot there was hundreds but you're the youngest no there was a lot of youngsters it's a young man's game why do you think there's a lot of people trying to find family or people who have come from broken homes what was the kind of caliber of trips that were there a lot of everything a lot of broken homes a lot of growing up in rough neighborhoods gangs regular great lives <clears throat> yeah I, what i saw was a lot of youth wanting direction i saw a lot of young men wanting purpose and they had that they had that they all were built the same mentally mm -hmm. how much did you get paid Back then. Oh no, man! It was like probably, probably two thousand dollars a month, maybe, maybe fifteen hundred dollars a month. See, when you're going through the training, do you get told where you're going to have to serve your time? Germany, Europe. I knew when I signed the paper, uh, Europe. I ended what? up going to Germany. Is that the first time you'd ever left America? Yes. What age? Again, seventeen, eighteen. Eighteen, December eight, two thousand two. <laughs> was it fresh? Was it fun? Was it exciting? It was freezing. <laughs> Fuck sake, you should have came to yeah. Scotland then, bro. Yeah, it was freaking cold, man. Um, but yeah, it was freezing. What was that? It, you know, I'm from Southern California. It's warm. This was ice cold, sleeping in the snow. 
went to deploy to Bosnia, and then we were training to go to Iraq. What was Bosnia like? Bosnia was interesting. The, the, the landscape was beautiful. The people were different. The culture was different. We trained alongside the, uh, the Brits and um, the Australian military. We trained, we, we worked, along, worked alongside them. Who do you think the best was, best training? We were all just hand to hand. I mean, together, working together. Any trouble because Americans, British? No, we were. Fr- it was friendly. It was all for happy, friendly, res- respectful. We used to salute those officers. Um, what are you getting told then when you go to Bosnia? Do you get told that these people are terrorists? These people are dangerous. Like obviously, we know now there was people were getting sent for weapons of mass destruction. There was no weapons. What, so, what so are you getting- Bo- Bosnia was a peacekeeping mission in two thousand three. September 2003, Iraq, our unit, 1st Infantry Division, didn't go to Iraq till 2004. The war had already kicked off. Yeah, the news, the propaganda the, was saying that the weapons of mass destruction, Saddam Hussein had weapons of mass destruction. He was um, an evil dictator who was oppressing his people and that his people wanted to be liberated. That's what they told us. And then we get there in 2004 and... No weapon to mass destruction. And the people did not seem too happy. Did not seem happy at all that we were there. And what are you thinking then once... You, what are you thinking at the time? Do you think you're doing the service for your country to protect your country and do the right thing? Just a young kid, naive, just to try to follow your orders? It, it was um, definitely naive. Definitely naive. 18, 19 years old, eight, 19 years old wanting to do the right thing um be having the cards stacked against you following orders and um a lot of hard lessons learned the hard way you know life lessons Mm -hmm. yeah because i've interviewed enough sas men and special forces and army and marines but at that time they believe they're doing the right thing in life that's what they genuinely believe they're just following orders because they believe it's the right thing to do it's obviously once you get a bit older and you start questioning more things and you realize what the media portrays lies and right and you can buy into it i believe a lot more people are waking up where they're not just going with what the media say now because i've spoke so many lies through the years and Mm -hmm. if you talk about 9-11 9-11 and what happened there nobody there's never really been concrete answers what really happened there either right so yeah you're absolutely 100 percent correct in 2023 everybody is more wiser to what's really going on in 2001 2002 oh no man it was the you know no n- internet was brand spanking you no cell phones um you believed what the media told you you didn't have no reason to question the media at that time, it's nobody else was putting out media except the media. So you're seeing the headlines, weapons of mass destruction, you know, and of, that, of course, that's by design. They're, they're, it's the war machine. They're propagating it. They're, 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 mm-hmm. they're building it up. And um, I'll tell you what, like initially when I landed in Iraq, I knew, I knew that those people didn't want us there simply by their facial expression. They, there was hatred in their eyes towards us. And understandably so, you know, we were in their country. And um, so the mission kind of, the mindset kind of changed from to just surviving. I got to survive and I, I got to get my friends out of here. The, it, no, it, politics were not a, involved, mm-hmm. a question. What's the population of Iraq? A lot. Because over a million Iraqis got killed, is that correct? Oh, a lot, a lot, uh, a, a lot. Is This was 2004. And you but, can understand why these countries are mad and angry that other foreigners are coming in and killing their women and killing their kids and it's, uh, it's sad to see but this this is happening now russia ukraine yeah. palestine israel everybody fighting and arguing people just seem to jump on i think people jump on what's cool on social media but nobody really knows what the fuck is going on people just jump on a side that's popular people don't really know the ins and outs and who's behind it who's pulling the strings who's funding both sides it's it's crazy to think how people are still brainwashed. People are still right. lack of knowledge. And it's not that they're bad. It's just they're so conditioned and programmed to believe what they read and what they see. 
Facts, facts. I, I believe people are at different levels uh, of um, open-mindedness and insight. You know, at one point I was at the bottom and uh, gullible to what was being said. So I understand that part. I also understand war, combat, how gray area it is, how ugly it is. You know, you mentioned women getting killed, children getting killed. Um, we killed guys. We killed males in front of their kids. And the reason that happened was because they brought their children to blow me up with a roadside bomb. So a dad brought his two kids to the location, detonated a bomb, and in turn, we returned fire. Luckily, none of the kids got hurt, but that was just by sheer luck. That's how horrible things can happen. Aside from bombings, bombing the wrong buildings, indiscriminately um, blowing things up. Yeah, for sure. It's ugly. And you're, you're right. That only manifests anger and more hatred towards, you know, the uh, opposing forces. What's the worst thing you've seen in Iraq? There's two things that I saw that were bad. Well, I take that back. There was a 13 months of a lot of bad things. Uh, one thing I saw was in January of 2005, a car bomb. It was one suicide bomber in a in a SUV. He drove up next to a van, a uh, bus full of Iraqi National Guard. So there was 21 Iraqi National Guard members here, and the one suicide bomber blew it up, blew the and so there was a total of 22 pieces of people everywhere, man. It was like it, it was just pieces of meat charred, like everything was charred, like charcoal. And since it was cold outside, you could see the smoke, the, the the steam coming from the pieces. And I remember being in the Humvee looking at just the destruction and not wanting to get out of the Humvee. My sergeant said, hey, get the fuck out. Get out right now. Does that still replay in your mind? It, it, it does. And I don't know why. It does. Because it's not a normal thing to see, though. It's not a humane thing. It's not why humans I believe are on this planet and like I say I've had grandparents who fought in World War 2 and um, they've done their thing I've got friends who serve in the army and I love them to bits it's their decision it's just wars for me is, it's no matter what way you look at it it's all murder from both sides it's bad I've seen people Hamas blowing people up in Israel and people are celebrating I've seen Israel blowing up people in Palestine and people celebrating both are wrong it's the people who control it and the people who are pu pu pushing the, the propaganda and pushing what narrative they want to prom promote for people to fight and hate each other. For me, the world is backwards. For me, it's just it's just all crazy to see other humans destroying other humans and celebrating kids dying. It's wrong. No matter what way you see it, and I can only see it from this way now because I speak to enough people mm -hmm. and I'm understanding life a bit more because I tried to join the Marines mm -hmm. when I was 18, so I would have been a different animal again, but... Right. Um, at that time, I just thought I was always playing with toy soldiers and tanks. And again, you don't know if that's there to then brainwash you to think it's cool watching army films and then you think it's normal. But it's not normal to see tanks. It's not normal to see troops in other countries and fighting and killing. It's it's sad. And it's always the same. It's been the same patterns it's, for hundreds of years, thousands of years. Yep. And nobody does anything about it. Right. History repeats itself. Yeah, constantly. I 100% agree with you. I, my mindset is where your mindset's at. We can see it now from the top down. Mm -hmm. But I've been, but I experienced being a pawn in the game. And that's not a cool feeling. You know, you feel like you got used. Even though, yes, I did sign up. I did, you know, raise my right hand, swore in to defend the country and then, and do my service. You're right. You're absolutely right. When there's a politicians and the people with power and the people with money pulling the strings, there's always an ulterior motive. There's always an agenda, whether it's oil, whether it's resources, minerals, um, gold, gold, poppy diamonds, foods. poppy, uh, poppy, the heroin. Yeah, and that, yeah. that, 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 that's a CIA involved. Yeah, yeah. You know, uh, let's keep it real. That's yeah. government entities. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Even Mexico. Some say they're the biggest drug dealers out of everyone. They no, this is the everything. truth. Yeah. You know, and I'm from America. This is the 100% truth. And everybody, a lot of people know here in the United States, like, um, we know, we know that the, we know that our government is rubbing elbows with these, you know, the Taliban, the cartel. It's all funding. And the people that are paying are the people that are at the bottom. Yeah. The destruction. And, 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 and about destruction, man, before I went to Iraq, 
we had a sergeant that came over to our unit in Germany. He had already been to Iraq. And I said, hey, what's it like over there, Sarge? And he said, a whole nother planet, a whole nother world. And, and, I, and I did, couldn't understand it. And when I get there, the sights, the sounds, hearing the prayers in the mosque, having people pull over on the side of the road, pull the rug out and start praying toward the east. All this is different. All this is um, different cultures. The total disregard for human life on both sides you know and at some point we get we get bloodthirsty rage and it becomes you know you become you know they say if you stare into be careful if you stare into the abyss because the abyss will stare back into you yeah but that's how the world is controlled fear the post videos twin towers these people are coming to get us this and that, so fear, you joined through fear, you joined through, you want to do the right thing and protect your people, mm -hmm. I've always said this, but I'm a Scotsman and I don't like wars, I don't like violence, but if people try to invade Scotland, I'd be the first one to put on my boots and grab a rifle to protect my own, because I believe all countries should be independent, listen, there shouldn't be borders, for me, the whole world, we're under one roof and that's earth, that's the, the country, but again, Divide and conquer, it's easy to control, it's easy to manipulate, it's easy to control by fear and get people hating on each other through religions and gods and beliefs and race and it's fucking crazy. Even sports teams, people oh, hate yeah. each other. So right. it's right down the list of everything is divided from a sports team to a country. I believe we're in a, u a unique time frame right now with the United States because I think they have over overplayed their hand. Um, I think people are fed up with them trying to be the world police and invading different countries. And even, I mean, our own people, we're sick of it. It's like, hey, we have a lot going on here. Homeless people, a homeless pro problem, fentanyl problem, a violence problem. Like the powers above are putting their efforts only to get richer. In the meantime, I mean, it, I look at it as a fall of Rome is what I look at it like. You joined the army through anger as well, like, try to do the right thing but how is it then when you see brothers dying loved ones and now you're at you're looking down at it now realizing shit i was used why did these people die like, how's that feeling so when you asked me what was the worst thing i meant i went right into the car bomb thing that was the most gruesome thing i saw because there was 22 of them in one shot but the worst day of my life happened when my friend got killed on my mom's birthday uh, september 10th 2004 um, Edgar Daclon, he was from Torrance, California, and we were out on a patrol. We kind of got ambushed. We got lured out there after our camp got mortared. They set us up, and as soon as my friend steps outside of the Humvee, they detonated the roadside bomb. It was two 155 rounds, and it blew them up. Blew them, blew them across the road. And um, I go over there and I look down. I, I run over there and I look down on him, and he's dead. And I just remember my whole world just, my, I felt my innocence leave me. I was 19 years old. My whole life I had been taught good things happen to good people. Bad things happen to bad people. And here is my friend dead in the middle of the road. But aside from that, there's still a job that has to be done. So I continue to shoot down the road, try to find the insurgent. And you talk about rage, hatred, when we had to load my friend's body in the helicopter, the medevac, and he flew away, along with two other wounded friends, including the lieutenant, there was Iraqis lined up on the side of the road, and I just remember looking at them like, I wanted them all dead. And that was hatred, pure hate and rage. Um, I no longer live like that, but I remember that feeling in my, in my heart. Mm -hmm. It was bad. How do you go over that? I had to seek, I had to seek treatment. I had to go to the VA hospital. I had to ask for help because I noticed I had a problem when I flew back into, into Dallas, Texas, and I saw an Iraqi lady or Middle Eastern lady with all her garb on and, and I instantly, the blood went through me. And I remember thinking like, why are you here in my country when we're over there dying for your country? Again, that's, you know, naiveness. But that's uh, how I felt at that time. I no longer feel like that. 
It's crazy how what it will do to you though. That's the perfect oh. example of you're killing people in that woman's country. <laughs> but yet you're still angry because people, even though we've got immigrants coming to the UK and people get angry, but mm -hmm. again, the UK's invaded over 90% of the countries on this planet. Right. So when people come there for a better life, if people are coming to go to new countries, I believe they've got to bring something. I believe they've got to work or bring a lot of positivity. There's a lot of people who come to these countries and a lot of kids are getting abused and get women are getting abused and people are getting beat up. It's, for me, it's not right. I don't care what skin colour you are, what religion you are, where you're from. Right. If, if you're a fucking idiot, you're an, you're an idiot. So it's just, <laughs> it, people, you get called racist, this and that. It's not, people just want to, because there's so much destruction in the countries in the UK as well, where um, it's, look after the people first from your own home to try and get that right, because homelessness is on the rise, addiction's on the rise, suicide's on the rise. So if people are want to emigrate and go to other countries, just as long as they're bringing something to it, willing to work, willing to, try and provide and by all means do what you want but if people are coming to other countries and try to kill people that's not that's not right man so i was a trained killing machine if you think about it our united states army infantry this is the only thing we do right but they kind of tried to tell us to be the world police when we got there as in hey let's hold down this fort while the Iraqi people rebuild their country and become some type of democratic, kind of like um, what we do, uh, mimicking what we do. Even though we were trained killers, we were not loose cannons. Uh, we were not loose missiles, meaning we had discipline, we had honor, we had loyalty. The only time we engaged was when we were engaged upon or when we were put in hostile situations. I know there's different um, incidents where there was massacres and war crimes, but the unit I was in, in the majority, the bad thing about that is innocent people do die in the crossfire. That's the truth. What was your unit? What were you there to do? Um, I was Charlie Company, 118 Infantry, uh, 1st Infantry Division. And uh, we actually got attached to Bravo 177 armor. We got attached to some tankers, but we were still an infantry platoon. Um, so some of our duties were to go. I mean, we, we were doing it all. Going out in the middle of the night and kicking in doors. And again, like you said, hey, you don't want your door kicked in. Kicking in doors, snatching people up, zip tying them, tying up their feet, putting sandbags over their head, separating the men from the women separating the children from the men and um sometimes they were bad guys sometimes they were not sometimes the, a lot of the times the information we got was not accurate who chooses who if they're good or bad to tie them up and putting sheets over their head who chooses that is that intelligence uh, or is it just winging it and pr if, it's procedure at the time how is that when you are doing that to fathers and their kids are screaming It was an adrenaline rush. It was a feeling of power because as a kid, I always wanted to be in the SWAT team with a police officer. I always wanted to kick in doors. And here's my opportunity to kick in doors. And as far as we are concerned, they are telling us, hey, this is a target. Your mission is to kill or capture so and so so when you're kicking in that door that's what you're going in with that mindset you're not going in that mindset with you know you're going to shake hands and drink some tea you, you're 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 going at two o'clock in the morning when they're asleep and you're, you're you're destroying that house you're making an entrance what's it like to kill someone it's um i i had never really killed an animal before like, I, I never really had a, uh, something to compare it to. Um, I guess you, I, it's, a, it's, a, it's crazy to say that, you know, you're trained to kill, kill, kill. And it's in every song, it's in every cadence and you get there and it's kind of like what you want to do, what you're programmed to do. And once you do it, it's like, 
you know, there's a lot of blood sometimes. I mean, there's not always blood. You know, once I shot a guy one time and they, my sergeant made me search him. And when I went like this, my hands slipped because they were so bloody. And I just remember looking like I got blood on my hands. Um, it, it bothered me, but I had to continue mission, continue, continue, because there's still other bad guys. We're running, we're pushing, we're kicking in doors, we're moving. We're, we're still moving. When we came back, the chaplain came and talked to me, which I thought was weird, but um, I didn't even know that he did this. And I'm sitting down on my bunk because I'm thinking I'm going to hell. I was raised a Catholic, and I know the, the Ten Commandments. And the chaplain's sitting across from me just like you are right now, and he says, I know what, I know what you're thinking. And I, in my head, I'm like, how do you know what I'm thinking? He's like, because uh, 20 years ago, I was sitting exactly where you were at in the Vietnam War. Or 30 years ago, and I'm like, well, damn. He's like, I did the same thing you did. He's like, um, what he said, the Bible says sh you shall not murder. He's like, in war, I don't know, he was like giving me some fluff or propaganda, but he said, you know, God accepts this in war. And that kind of, that made me feel better. But <laughs> I believe that's something once you do it, you've already crossed the line, you've crossed the threshold that most people have never crossed. I interviewed an amazing man <coughs> called Craig Harrison. He was a sniper from the UK, the world's longest sniper kill. I think it was over a mile and a half or something, but he killed like 88 people. 88? 88, and his head is gone. And he's such an amazing man, but <coughs> his head is gone, and he's so damaged here, he wants to go back to a war zone where he fe feels at peace. Look, I got out of the army in 2005. What was that decision? Honorable discharge. Um, my time, my contract was up. Only three years? Only three years from 2002 to 2005. And the goal was to become a, a correctional officer, work in the prison, California. And that's what happened. But when I left Iraq, I told myself, I'm done. I'm done. I, I want to get out of here. I don't ever want to come back. I don't ever want my life to be in danger again. I hate this place. And then you come home and this place is, you just don't fit in. You don't fit in. It's everything's different. The people are oblivious. You know, I find people to be disrespectful. And now I find myself, even as we speak right now, I'm currently in the process of trying to get myself back overseas, doing some type of work. And um, I, I can't, honestly, I can't tell you what that is. As far as the calling, uh, there's something inside of me where I just can't be here and I have to be somewhere else. I don't know if that makes sense. Yeah, of course. It's just <clears throat> your head will be fucking gone as well because of the shit that you've seen, the shit that you've done to try and overcome it. That ain't normal. So to still be here, you'll know yourself the amount of suicide that happens with veterans. How many homeless men are on the street who are veterans? Remember, people... These men believe they were fighting for their country, dying for their country, but yet nobody fights or dies for them to make sure they're okay. That's the sad thing about it. It's just a pawn in a game. People getting used, I think. The old Charlie Chaplin uh, video, I think from the 40s, talking about machine minds with machine guns. It's not humane to be following these people and, and doing what these guys order you to do. Because if these fucking governments and guys in suits want to send young kids to go and fight for them. These fucking idiots should be fighting. Go and go with your suit and fight each other and sort it out. Don't send young innocent kids at 16, 17, 18 who then destroys their life because it's a life sentence for them coming back when they struggle. But people need to understand, I don't have all the answers because I'm not <clears throat> as well connected to understand how this game operates, but I've got a rough idea with the years and years of consistency of everything repeating itself, mm -hmm. okay, something's not right. But when you talk about this stuff, people call you a conspiracy theorist, but it's not. It's just history. History's there. Do you know what I mean? So see, when you came out after the three years, what was the plans for you to be a, a prison officer? A CEO, you call them here, a correction officer? Yeah, correctional officer, prison guard, a CEO. Mm -hmm. And you're 100% right. Young kids experiencing this, 18, 19. Here's a scientific fact. The human brain doesn't stop developing till the age of 26. So you're still learning. You're still growing. You're still inputting things in here. So you got to think about the stuff that I put in there. 
you know, being in war, being in combat, seeing these atro- atrocities, causing these atrocities, being part of it, uh, <laughs> a lot of destruction and devastation. So I come back in 2005 and I am lost. I am lost. I start abusing alcohol and I start abusing drugs instantly. I already abused alcohol prior, but it just got turned up a fifth of vodka a night. And I was self-medicating and um, it, it landed me in some trouble. I almost didn't become a correctional officer. I was able to manage to get in and I got in at the age of 22 in the year 2006. And um, I started a max security prison, Sentinella State Prison. Level four, which is the highest level, general population. So they're the um, the killers. What was the decision to do that? <laughs> my father. My <laughs> father was a prison fucking guard. safe in Iraq. My, my father. <laughs> <laughs> Fuck's sake. Uh, I've always been an adrenaline junkie. Yeah. You know, I've always been kind of, I was a skateboarder. I used to jump off the roof of my mm-hmm. skateboard. I've always been an adrenaline junkie. And the pay, the pay is outstanding. The is pay that? is great. Has that? Before I left, you know, I was, I was a lieutenant, but I was probably making eleven thousand dollars a month. That's a lot. So, what's the difference then from going to a war zone to then being in a, basically another war zone where it's more control, but your own people are then trying to kill you? I'd imagine because you're in with the the elite of the elite, the proper murderers and serial killers. The difference is that you don't have a gun. You don't have a gun working the line. Um, communication skills. You learn how to talk. You learn how to de-escalate as much as possible because that's your biggest tool. That's going to, um, because yeah, even though they're in prison, they're still human, you know, uh, unless they're completely psychopath, the serial killers, and those guys are different. Those guys, there's no talking to them. There's nothing there, but it's, um, you want to talk about an adrenaline rush. Yeah, man. You see a riot with a hundred, 200, 300 guys stabbing each other and beating each other up. Oh, it's an adrenaline rush. How many inmates? Like a hundred. Well, how like in the riots would be like two hundred man riots. How many in the prison altogether? Total at it, 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 total was a, between four thousand to five thousand per many, per prison. How many prison guards? <laughs> Not much. Um, probably eight. So eight hundred prison guards, four thousand inmates. <laughs> You're outnumbered. You're outnumbered. And the bad thing about the the Mexicans, the Southern Mexicans, is they have a rule. If you get in in a fight with one of them, all their friends are going to jump in and beat you up or stab you. How many gangs are in these American prisons? You got your big, big gangs, your Mexican mafia, your Aryan Brotherhood, your Black Guerrilla family, and the Nuestra Familia. Other than that, you have all the gangs that function underneath them or their own little entities who run what gang runs the prison is it the Aryan brotherhood still the um has it changed i'm gonna keep it real i'm gonna keep it real from a operational business because that's what they are they're 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 criminal they're criminal organizations okay Mm -hmm. structure numbers money the mexican mafia mexican mafia is probably number one Right under that, Nuestra Familia, that's the Northern Hispanics there. And then you got the Aryan Brotherhood and the Black Gorilla family. And that's solely present times because of all the federal criminal indictments. A lot of these gang members are going to the federal prison system. You know, I work for the state. They're two separate prison systems. What's the difference? The state is like California. They committed a crime. When you start going into federal, it's kind of where El Chapo... Um, Florence ADX Max, where they, you know they really put you in a dungeon, and they don't. Those guys are not trying to go to f- the feds. Mm-hmm. Why is there so many snitches? Because it's a sell. There's no honor amongst thieves. Um, you know, not every gang member, gang banger, has a sense of principles or morals, or they didn't expect the consequences, like um. Maybe five guys go do something. One of them wasn't completely on board or two or three of them weren't, weren't mentally prepared to do what they were going to do. They're going to flip. They're going to rat. 
What sort of training do you have to do to become a prison officer? 16-week academy in Sacramento, California. You learn the law, you know, because you are a peace officer. You have the powers to arrest inside of a prison. Drug identification, you know, and I remember, I remember when fentanyl came on scene in the prison system before they had heroin. When fentanyl came on, inmates started overdosing by the numbers, dying. We all just thought it was a bad batch of heroin. Later, that would actually turn out to be fentanyl. And now, there are so many overdoses. As a matter of fact, one of my friends from back home that I grew up with, who was an inmate in prison, just overdosed and died two days ago. And I seen him when I was working in there. It's real. How many different prisons did you work? Two. One, Sentinel State Prison, and then the last one when I left, uh, Donovan Correctional Facility in San Diego. Now, that place was like a, a, a nut house, a psych ward, mentally unstable in this. That's a whole nother dangerous game. They're violent. How violent? Impulsive, violent. You, they would just snap and set like, no limits. Are you on guard 24-7 when you're there? Are you paranoia is heightened? How is that? Does that then, because you've been in Iraq, because you've fought in wars, it's then easier because you're more aware of your surroundings or is it a different ball game? It's the same hypervigilance, hyper alertness. The problem with that is it drains you. It drains you mentally. So I mentioned for 20 years, I was always looking over my shoulder, looking over my back being on guard, you know, that, that does something to your blood pressure, to your anxiety, to your stress, to your hormones, to your testosterone levels. You know, it raises, it raises your cortisol levels, cortisol, cortisone, cortisol, one of the two. Yeah. Um, stress response. Yeah. So, you know, um, serotonin, all of this, uh, adrenaline rushes, adrenaline dumps, um, <clears throat> That takes its toll on you when you go home. You know, I got a wife and a daughter. It, it, it's like you crash and you don't want to do nothing. And they're looking at you like, why are you so tired all the time? Why don't you have energy? Depressed? I, I never been depressed. I, I don't like to use the word depressed. For me, it was more of anxiety, isolation. To me, when I think of depressed, I think sad. I wasn't, I wasn't sad. I was more jumpy. Could you make friends in these institutes or is that too dangerous? With the, go, with the it, inmates? No, no, you cannot, no. What you do is you develop a rapport, a working rapport. So, hey, um, hey, John, how's it going today? Oh, it's doing good. Okay, cool. Everything good? Yeah. Um, you know, who, who do you got on the football game today? Like that. You're not, you are not. They'll try to ask you, hey, man, where do you live? Or do you have a wife? And you just don't answer. You just say, come on, man. And they know. Try to use it against you. Manipulation. It's, yeah. a, it's a con game. Yeah. Cat and mouse game. What sort of things did you see in these prisons? Murders. Two inmates with knives, homemade, shanks, shivs, stabbing other inmates in the chest area, under the armpit, in the neck, in the throat, in the eye. Or, um suicides inmates tying up their sheets hanging them to the light fixture one thing i saw that was weird was the inmate committed suicide on his knees on his knees on the floor he tied a noose around his neck tied it to the bunk was on his knees and he just leaned forward and killed himself he just leaned forward and died he he let it like choke him out you think your natural re response would be lean back? Could lean some, back, could, jump up. Could somebody have murdered him? No, he died. He did it to himself. Um, so I, it, that's what I found very weird. Well, that one, um, overdoses where they die, you know, they vomit. They're blue. They pee their pants. They poop their pants. They're foaming at the mouth. They're bloated. They're stiff. You know, rigor mortis. Um, those are just the deaths, but there's batteries where slicing, slicing, 
stabbings. Hot water, sugar. So they have uh, hot pots. They get hot water. They boil it. Then they put baby oil in it. And then they throw it on somebody. And that just ripped, that just burns their skin all, completely off. That I thought was horrible. How is that then seeing destruction, being in a low vibrational negative surroundings for 20 years? It was taxing. It was draining. It was not, at the end, it was not worth it. The juice was not worth the squeeze. Yeah, and technically, it should have never been worth it. It should have never been, but you got to figure, I kind of prided myself in, hey, I'm really good at this. I'm really good at dealing with this chaos, right? Because I, I often used to say I thrive in chaos. You know, I believe people have different skill sets. You know, some people are good at playing cards. Some people are good at uh, magic tricks. I happen to be good when things are just completely freaking haywire. Everything slows down in time for me and I'm able to see things and make decisions and try to survive. So I thrived on that, but it's definitely taxing on the mind. Do you think you needed something like that though after the war? I think everything in my life has happened for a reason. Because you're the struggle to, you couldn't have worked on an office job. Oh, I couldn't do an office you know job. I mean? You'd have fucking, you'd have probably killed some cunt. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I couldn't do an office. You're right. Okay, so I, there's no way in hell I could go from Iraq to an office job. Yeah. Not going to happen. Hell no. Because yeah, you're right. I would be too, too amped up. Mm -hmm. So maybe I did need that. You know, I did get to be in the gun post with the, with the, it shoots block guns, 40 millimeter. It shoots block, wooden blocks or sponges. And I did get to shoot a lot of inmates with the, with, during riots. That gave me another sense of like service, doing something, you know. And it's sad to say like hurting people, you know, because in essence, you got to become great at violence yourself to survive. But what are you really doing? You're hurting people. Yeah, it's a dog eats dog world out there. That were you starting to thrive on violence and hurting people? Were you starting to get a buzz where you're getting away with it because it's your job, but you knew what you were doing was was still hurting people. I'm gonna keep it honest with you, man. That's the truth. The truth is, you're in the military. You're kicking in doors. You're throwing people on the ground. You're handcuffing them. You're getting a pass right? You're, you're doing, you're working on behalf of the government. It's almost like a hitman in a way, you know, that's not the, that's not the mindset, but in a way you're a government employee and your job is to do this. So you're getting paid for it. You're getting your friends, your friends are telling you, Hey man, good job. Good job. Oh, you did good. Oh, I saw you shoot that guy. So the environment thrives of like, right. It's, what do you want to say? Like a Spartan in war? It's almost like the same. Yeah, yeah, I didn't. It's not till after the fact, now that I'm older, that I look back and I think that was not cool. That was not cool. Was there any ever hits out or attacks out in your own life in prison? I've been involved in a lot of inmates attacking my partners, guards. Not me personally, but I've been in the area and have responded one inmate, man, Jesus, he tied a shank to his hand, a knife. He tied it to his hand like this, in between his thing, and his fingers, his palm. So when he went like this, it would, it would not, it would not drop. And he stabbed my off. I was a sergeant, brand new sergeant, and he stabbed my officer in the vest, in the bicep. So, of course, we had to use force. So towards the end, we never wanted to use force. Towards the end, we just want to go to work and go home. But yeah, prior to that, especially in this time, so you know, we take out our batons. My part, that officer hits him in the head, boom, drops him. But the problem is, he had been smoking meth for three days, so he hadn't slept in three or five days. So he jumps back up. So they tackle him, and then that's when I come in because I hear the alarm. And I see that he has a knife in his hand. So I, with my baton, I break his arm. But it doesn't stop him because he's high on drugs. He just flails it. So it took a while for us to cut that knife off. But in the meantime, 
we're stomping the guy out because he's a threat the whole entire time. But uh, it's a very dangerous job. It's an extremely dangerous job. What sort of prisoners were proper crazy in there? Did you have any high, high profile names? Sirhan Sirhan, he killed uh, one of the Kennedy guys. Um, yeah, Tex Watson, he was part of the Charles Manson um, crew. Eric and Lyle Menendez, the Menendez brothers, they killed their parents back in the 90s. They were there at the prison I was at. Suge Knight from Death Row Records, he was on Alpha Yard. I, I talked to him a couple times. How was Suge? He's very, he's a big guy. Yeah, he's massive. He was a proper gangster. He was a proper <laughs> nutcase. <laughs> what, he was a fucking psycho. He was, people were terrified of him. He him and his crew they didn't fuck around back in the day. When you hear interviews and stuff, he was a loose cannon. He was probably he's probably the, the fall of Tupac. I was a massive Tupac fan back in the day. He was a proper poet, a proper just arts and crafts, good kid. And then obviously just got led up in that life where Two options, dead or prison. Right. He's a, you're right. He's a proper gangster. He's a, he's a big gangster. Um, he's about that life. Every interaction we had with me and him was very respectful. Um, but he's, he's probably one of those guys that, hey, when push comes to shove or he doesn't get what he wants, he's going to use means of violence to accomplish that. Did Suge Knight have pool in prison? Or was he getting older? People knew who he was. People just respected him right off the bat. I mean, you. I mean, it's Shug Knight. You're just gonna. He he wasn't bothering nobody, so nobody's gonna bother him. That's kind of the way it was. Yeah, you you've exposed a lot of stuff in the prison system. What stuff were you kind of exposing? So when I promoted, I promoted from officer to sergeant to lieutenant. You know, and I got a job where I was a warden's right hand man, in the same office as a warden. I got exposed to a lot of corruption that I saw firsthand. You know, you talk about the military, you talk about politics, you talk about law. It's the same thing inside the California penal system. Same thing. Same thing. Per people doing things for personal gain. People at the top putting officers' lives in danger for promotions, for to sabotage other people. It's a, it's a grimy cutthroat game. Um, I was involved... I responded to a, there was a captain. There was a captain that worked at the prison that I was at. He was an, he was an idiot, downright an idiot, but the warden loved him. He made friends with a Mexican mafia member, and we just talked about why it's not a good idea to become friends with each other. Well, ultimately, something happened where that Mexican mafia member and all his friends stabbed two officers in the, in the mouth, in the back, in the neck, took their sticks away, started hitting the officers with their own sticks in the face. I mean, they, they, they put these guys in the hospital. They put the officers in the hospital on life support pretty much. And the warden covered it up, covered up the whole incident because he didn't want his captain to get in trouble. That's corruption. What you're thinking then? It was my job to report what was happening. And they told me to stand down and not report. That's when I opened my eyes to the like, oh man, the hell? This is real, right? Because I would have never known about corruption and if I hadn't seen it myself. So now I make it a goal kind of just, to, just I mean, same thing you do is open people's eyes. Hey man, this is happening over here. I experienced it. What's the worst thing you seen in prison? I don't want to say murders. I, it's kind of crazy because it's not murders. And I've seen people get stabbed. They, they die. That's not, to me, that's not the worst thing. I would say the worst thing is you having young inmates, younger than me, die. Unnecessary deaths. Because it was, one time there was an 18-year-old kid, a white guy. He overdosed on fentanyl. Or he overdosed on something. And he was in the hospital. And I was on guard. I was guarding him at the hospital. He was on life support. His grandpa comes in, looks at him and says, what a waste. And walks out. And that kind of stuff. 
I don't li- I don't like to see the youth throw their life away. Yeah. Unnecessarily. Yeah, it's sad that, but once you're in those kind of prisons and around that environment, eighty percent of people end up back. It's, it's a kind of it's just one way ticket to a life of misery. A lot of people don't wake in it. A lot of people don't get the help that they need to then make the changes to then come out and try and be a better person. But some of your best motivational speakers are the people who are teaching at schools and other prisons are the ones who have lived that life. Right. Those people do change and that's the beautiful thing about it. So that's another reason why I resigned. I left the prison 11 months ago because I was starting to see a lot of inmates change, change their behavior and, and get out. And never go back. When at one point, my mindset was, hey, these guys are never going to change. They're never going to get out. They're the same. They love crime. They love victimizing people. Right? But when I started seeing that change, internally, I was conflicted. Like, whoa, wait a minute. Right? Well, my, why am I feeling like this? This is not. This is going to put me in a jam as far as like. My belief systems. Right? My. It always goes back to belief systems. It just wasn't worth it anymore for me. I just, what I was partaking in, you know, I was doing the, I was another pawn. I hate to say it, man. I was a pawn for the military and I was a pawn for the California Department of Corrections. I've been a pawn twice, right? And and it's not a good feeling. How was that when you're straight peg, trying to do the right things, trying to, just do your job and trying to protect and serve in the military and then go to prison service, try and be a good guy to then see that there's, there's corruption everywhere. Nobody's a hundred percent legit. Nobody's I'm out for myself, but mm-hmm. I would never fuck anybody over. Right. They get, the reason I get the guests is what I get is because I built out an element of trust. I built out a rapport where people right. go, he's a good guy. There's no many people out there would ever say a bad word about me, especially now that I'm doing the right things. Right. Everything's a hundred percent. I do things for me and my family, but I would always help people around that if they need it, if I genuinely think they deserve it as well. I don't just go and help everybody because there's a lot of fake it's out there who I know would never do fuck all for me. So it's just, how does that make you feel? Just, do you feel as if you've lost a lot of time in your life by involved in that or is it all a lesson learned? What I feel is that, again, everything happened for a reason, right? For the longest time, I cursed God for not letting me get killed in Iraq. I cursed God for having my friends get killed and not me not dying. Right? I said, why me? What, why am I so special? Why did I make it back? And I had numerous life and death situations over and over and over. And I couldn't die. I couldn't die. And I felt like I was cursed. But now I see that everything happened for a reason. Going off to war, experiencing that trauma, experiencing that substance abuse, going to the prison system, <laughs> shooting these inmates in riots, right? Uh, breaking their arms when they were attacking staff members, watching them change, watching uh, my own higher ups be corrupt. So now I leave. I don't feel bad in the sense that I always carried myself honorable. Okay. So for me to have carried myself a certain way in the worst situations, I have a lot of support on YouTube. I have a lot of support from people because just like you said, I think they can see the authenticity. They can see the trust. They can see the passion. And basically, that's what it is. I'm passionate about helping others. And there's no way in hell I would be at this level if I didn't experience everything else. Did you see many prisoners change? Guys who were doing 30, 40, 50 years. Because how did they get through that? Because American system is different from the UK. If you get life, you can be out in maybe 20 years, 25 years. But America, they're giving out sentences like 100 years, 150 years. So... When I joined in 2006, my father was a prison guard. He joined in 1993. He always said, Hector, if the inmates have 25 to life, 15 to life, 10 to life, they're never getting out. They're not going home. They got that L. They got that life. That's a wrap. They're going to die in prison. I remember hearing that. And that was the truth. Every inmate that had a life sentence was not getting out. And it showed. It showed in the prison, the brutality. You had two young guys with knives just brutally murdering somebody else. They had no hope. Why, why, why would they not do that? Mm-hmm. But then the laws changed, right? And, you know, laws, politics. This was a good thing. Letting some lifers out 
gave them hope. Therefore, the violence got reduced. I did see this. But the problem was they also let a lot of monsters out they shouldn't have let out. They let a lot of monsters out that were getting in gunfights with police officers on the streets, killing the police officers, and then getting killed themselves. But I did see a lot of inmates slash convicts change their life. That's also part of what I do now. I speak out on behalf of those individuals. In other words, um, what do you want to call it? Um, you want to call it um, like not standing up for them, but kind of like, you know, referencing like, hey, yeah, these dudes, they do change. I've seen it. There's guys out here that did 20 years. And I asked them too, man, how did you do it? How were you in a box for 30 years? Because there were some guys in isolation. The shoe, that's different. You're in a box. You're not getting out of that box. And they said, routine. I did the same exact thing every single day. I woke up. I brushed my teeth. I worked out. I rolled up my mattress. I ate. I read. I worked out. Every single day, the same thing for 30 years. Was there a lot of see, those people who are doing life sentences? Did I have a lot of gay relationships? There is a lot that goes on uh, on, on sensitive needs yards. That's protective custody. That's where you got the child molesters, the rapists, the mm. rats, the people that fell out of their gangs, good graces. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, man. It's like they're in love with them. It's, they're in love with them. Yeah, because I had a prison officer from the UK on mm -hmm. a few weeks ago, and he says it's prison gay. But for me, you're fucking gay. You're gay. It's, I, I feel as if that's just a cover-up. I, I don't... You, you know what's crazy is that I'll say it right here, because uh, Charlie R. R. J. D. These guys will be kissing their boyfriend on the yard, right? Their boyfriend, he looks like a girl, like transgender. Be kissing him, kissing him, kissing him, holding their hand, walking around like, the, like they're at the park. And then in the weekend, that guy's wife will come and visit. And he'll kiss her on the lips. And she don't even know that he's... Uh, That's nasty. Yeah. That's, fucking, That's the truth. That's some nasty shit. That's the truth. I would rather see fucking... <laughs> I'd rather see fucking dead bodies and oh, yeah. some of that creepy shit. Like, oh, if you're gay, you're gay, so I don't care, but it's the, me, it's the me, lies and the deceit of the married wife and the, so the kids. So when I was a sergeant, I walked out of my office door. I told you, I went to the new prison. The new prison was like a psych ward. I walked out and I looked to my right and I see two guys kissing. And I see two guys kissing and I had never seen this in 10 years. And I, and I see them and I go into shock and I go back in the office and I'm like, the hell? How do I, how do I address this? What the <laughs> hell? You know, and I go, I go outside and I said, Hey, knock it off. And they start giggling and they walk it off. But <laughs> <laughs> there's no playbook. Yeah. <laughs> how bad was your addiction? When did, when was that? It's hate. Oh man. Alcoholism. So I'm an alcoholic. I'm an alcoholic by definition. I just hit 13 years of sobriety. Congratulations. Thank God. Yeah. Thank you. Um, you know, one day at a time. Yeah. And uh, drugs are a part of my story. The only reason I did drugs, coke, meth, was so I could stay up longer and drink more. You know, when I became a prison guard prior, I was able to stop drugs on my own. I just stopped because, I, you know, you can't be a prison guard and you can't do drugs. Did you get drug tested? Yeah, you get randomly drug tested, right? Are there prison guards that use drugs? Yeah, there is. But that, that wasn't, that's not me. Like I said, I like to do things honorable. Um but my drinking, I hit my bottom in 2010, blacking out drunk, crashing vehicles, being uh, verbally and physically abusive, uh, just, um, it was not cool, man. It was not cool. Became a different person, Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. And uh, with post-traumatic stress disorder, it was like putting gasoline on a fire. And in 2010, I asked for help at the VA, you know, cause I didn't, I wasn't going to kill myself. I wasn't going to kill myself. Did you think about it though? I wanted to die. I wanted to die, but I wasn't going to kill myself. So what I would do is I would act like a maniac, drive drunk, drive fast, pick fights, sleep with married women. Just, it, you could just imagine just wild with it. I didn't want to live. But I wasn't going to go get a gun and shoot myself. I wasn't going to hang myself. 
I wasn't going to do that. But I absolutely did not want to live. I don't know why. Uh, well, I don't know why I never just did it, or I, I couldn't. I couldn't do it. What made you ask for help? And how hard was it to ask for help? Because you know yourself, too much pride and ego. Nobody wants to admit, especially men. Men, we've got the great superpower of all time, where everybody will smile even though they're broken inside. We never admit those problems. Especially Hispanic men, Mexican men, the machismo. Um, I would have rather died than ask for help. Like I said, I wasn't, I wasn't toying around. This was serious. This was extremely serious. I was 21, 22, 23, 24 years old, breaking my parents' heart, breaking my family's heart. Um, not because I was a bad person, but because I was a sick person. Um, I hit my bottom. I hit my bottom. And this is what I say. I was either going to die for sure, or I was going to make it. That was it. And I chose to ask for help. Um, it was the most courageous thing I've ever done. Think about that, man. I served in the military, went through combat. I served in the prison system, saw a lot of things. But me asking for help was by far the most courageous and hardest thing I ever had to do. But it's where it all began. That's when the real work began. How hard does it come through that when you start having to process the screams, the dead bodies, the killings, the abuse that you're then giving your own body and mindset? Because change is a, I don't care who you are, everybody can change, but it's a fucking, it's a hard road because you have to dig deep and, and then just because you're you're clean, you're not safe because then it, it brings, brings all the old emotions that you've blocked out <laughs> with drinking and taking drugs. So then you have to face that fucking nightmare. But once you get over that, I still struggle. And I always say this on the podcast, I genuinely still struggle because it's, I like to be lazy. I like to sit around. But when I do that, the voices get louder. So when I'm active doing podcasts and traveling, mm -hmm. the quiet, right. the quiet. But when I'm in peace, I, I can because I used to always say to people, sometimes I used to, because I used to think I was bored, but it's because my life was full of chaos. I got boredom and peace mixed up because when your life's peace, it's, it's good to meditate in this. But if I slow down too much, the voices start creeping in. Have a drink, have a bit of cocaine, go and gamble, womanize all the negative traits. And that's why I'll just keep busy. So I mean, I believe I'm in full control, but I don't, it doesn't have the same power over me. But I know it's still there, and I know it's it's always knocking at the door. Oh, it was a fucking monster, man. It was a beast. It was a beast because I had to do it sober. I had to do it raw, sober. So <laughs> everything I had drank and self-medicated and pushed down, it didn't go away. It didn't erase. All that got addressed purposely. The psychiatrist, the therapist pulled it out. The thing about the brain is the brain got rewired. The re brain can rewire itself. Yeah, yeah. All the trauma, all the life and death suit, suit, um, survival. So I had to unrewire my brain. You know, the reptile part of the brain in the front mm -hmm. or wherever it's at. You know, I learned all this stuff. The frontal lobe as well. Flight or flight. Yeah. Yeah, uh, freeze. Fight, yeah, fight the whole fight. frontal lobe. So I, l even learning that helped me. Hey, Hector, you're not crazy. You're not a maniac. You're not a psycho. You know, they did tell me, Hector, you know what, how you know you're not a psycho? And I'm like, well, how? Because like, you feel bad. You're crying right now because of all the stuff that you did. Yeah, you feel emotion. Correct. Psychopaths are cold. They're Correct. They're numb to and I'm like, feel. oh, well, that's good. <laughs> yeah, because you do question it. Because doing that is psychotic behavior. Right. Fucking angry and want to kill people and kill yourself. It is psychotic right. behavior. Self-harming. Because drinking and taking drugs is self-harming. Just because you're not slitting your wrists, you're fucking getting high as a motherfucker. <laughs> fucking shooting bullets into the, the roof. <laughs> That's Screaming at your pillow at night. Just, that ain't normal behaviour. That is psychotic. Correct. <laughs> Correct. I'm laughing when people tell me horror stories. I laugh because I think, yeah, I've been there. I don't understand the pain. Because anybody I see drunk or even out now, I don't judge. I still go out and have nights out and I'll maybe spend two hours and then I, I just disappear like a magician. I don't even say bye, I just right. smoke bomb. But you see the change in people. You see the, mm. the their adrenaline rising, their energy levels rising, but it's not real. 
I walk into a room, head held high, I walk in places myself, I'll, I'm confident in myself. Back in the day, I had to get full of cocaine and alcohol to mm -hmm. feel part of something. But now I think, fuck it. Now I, I see people and I'm always analysing and I see people's struggles and I think, I would never say to them because they're out enjoying their night. The last thing you want to do is saying that you're in a bad place. Right. But if you actually took them outside and says, are you okay? They would probably break down. The majority of people who I do, like, everything okay, listen, don't need to bullshit. Something goes, and then they'll open up. Right. Because that, for me, is a mask, and it's the most glorified drug on the planet is alcohol. So as for me, it's a mass destruction, but it's so glorified and so normalized. It's in every street corner, every shop, every hotel, every restaurant. And it destroys lives. It just changes people. People make bad decisions. It comes from that Arabic word, which means alcohol, which means ghoul, which means body eating spirits. So they call it spirits for a reason because they say the spirits take over the body. So when people black out, it's because the soul so polluted it leaves the body. And then that's where the entities do their work and you do bad things, sleeping around and I making never, mistakes. I never heard that, but that makes total sense. Yeah, spirits for a reason, bro. Man. Yeah, and I did black out, you know, and I, what do they say? I couldn't get drunk and I couldn't get sober towards the end. I wasn't enjoying it. The, towards the end, I was not enjoying it at all. It was, it was, it was bad, man. It was, you know, throwing up. And um, what scares me now for these young children is the new stuff, the gummy bears that have drugs in it, the fantanol, the meth, the, the, the ecstasy. There's just so much you don't even know what you're getting. The, yeah. the cartels are just, I, I was listening to a podcast. They're just chopping stuff up and mixing it and just pushing it out. Yeah, I had a drug lord on. They used to put tires mixed in with the cocaine, but when you snort it, it gives you brain cancer. What the hell? Yeah, and we used to have a bad Valium crisis back in the UK, um, street Valium, which was mixed with rat poison and it was killing people. Oh my God. Do you know what I mean? These people don't care. They're drug dealers. They're ruthless. They just want money. Money. Yeah, they don't give a fuck. Same as the government. They're just creating wars and creating mass destruction for money. Pharmaceutical industry, money. They don't create customers. Like They're not creating cures. They're creating customers. <clears throat> but I do see people that are sick. <clears throat> sick. I do see people that are hurting. Right? And like you said, you just don't approach it that way. But you do say, hey, man, you ever want to talk? I'm here. Mm -hmm. Is there anything you're going through? Um, hey, like, sometimes, like, They'll tell me, oh, you quit drinking, you, you, that's good, I want to stop. I'm like, I tell them, you should, man. It's mm -hmm. the best decision I ever made. Yeah. What sort of process did you have to go through? The psych ward. The psych ward at the VA hospital is where I started. When I went to the emergency room and asked for help, they told me to go upstairs, upstairs with a psych ward. Uh, it was voluntarily put me in a gown, and in there I went to my first AA meeting. First AA meeting ever. And after that, it's been on and cracking. I went to a 28-day inpatient treatment rehab right after the psych ward. And I was, tack I was doing classes on anger management, post-traumatic stress disorder, substance abuse, constant, nonstop, from 2010 all the way to, to now, 2023. Did you do, is it, do you do 12-step programs here? I do. Yeah, I do Alcoholics Anonymous. Yeah, because I've done a N A C A G A. I used to dip my toe into everyone just to get a bit of knowledge. It's like medicine. Um, but the GA was my main one. I was a bad gambler. Okay. The gambling was my, that was the worst. But everything else followed with that. You tend to see if you open one door to the negative, you open the rest of them and they just all come flooding in. So you try to replace the pain and the, the not feeling good enough because you're embarrassed and ashamed of who you've become. So you just suppress it with all the negative stuff. For my own opinion. Right. Do you know what I mean? So... When you're in the psych ward and you're you're going through the process, when were you at your lowest? Because there. even though you're getting help, you've there. still got to go down and down before you eventually start no, rising. No, the lowest was sitting in the psych ward. Was the it? lowest was sitting in that bed with some homeless guy freaking jacking off, man. <laughs> and I never said this shit before in public, but fucking homeless guy jacking off right there, you know, talking to himself and me sitting down thinking, this is where my alcohol led me my alcoholism and that was my lowest because my dad had just dropped me off and said i'm done with you don't ever call us again you're dead to us my fiance at the time was done with me my job i was about to lose my job for the third time was done with me 
I lost it. I totaled my truck going eight miles per hour. I survived. I wasn't happy that I survived. Enough was enough. See, that's the thing about destroying your life. You don't just destroy your own life. You destroy everybody else's around you. It has the effect on everyone. The partner who loves you, the kids who loves you, the father and mum who just... And you can understand that. And that's the most heartbreaking thing. If you're a strong, loving mother or father, there's only so much you can do because it destroys them mentally. And your dad probably tough love, hoping I'm walking away, hoping... He does. It's calling your bluff as well. He's never going to walk away if he's actually took you to the place. He's just hoping, fucking get your so shit sorted or you lose me. And that's the sad thing about addiction. People give up their kids, their family, their right to be loved because they chose the bottle, they chose the packet or whatever it is. It's, it's sad to think that people actually give up a life, family life, for something that absolutely destroys their life. Hospitals, jails, or institutions. That's where they say it leads you. I've hit all three. I went to jail numerous times under because of alcohol. <clears throat> Working in a prison, I saw cirrhosis of the liver over and over and over again. Hepatitis C, people that are yellow with jaundice. Jaundice. It's a horrible death. It's a slow, painful death. Your organs start shutting down. Your liver shuts down. Your lungs shut. Everything just, you, you're dying. And what were you thinking then when you're looking around and seeing that? Did you ever think that? You would never get out or did you go i'm too strong to s just settle for this i'm gonna be honest with you there is nothing stopping me from going back out right i tell people i'm not any further away from a drink than when i first walked into these rooms if i can if i don't continue working on my sobriety working on my recovery my spirituality i will go back this has to be a daily reprieve right progress not perfection um I cannot stay sober off of yesterday's sobriety. And let me tell you, I'll be honest with you, man. Lately, I've been a horrible fucking husband, right? I, I, I'll be honest with you, man. I don't even know if I'm going to have a wife when I go back after, after this trip. It, it's been fucked up. And this is me sober. This is me 13 years sober. I still got character defects. Um, but uh, I know that alcohol is not going to make it better. I know that for a fact. I know that drugs aren't going to make it better. Did it cross my mind? I'm in New York right now. I was flying over here. And I'll keep it real with you. I thought, oh, well, I can do some lines of cocaine, right? But no, I can't. That's my insanity. That's insanity. That's my addiction. That's my disease. Of course I cannot do that. I have a five-year-old daughter. I will, you know, I put sobriety first in front of any, everything and even my daughter. Yeah, you have to. I have to. <clears throat> yeah. And I do. And that was hard to do, but I, I know I have to do that. But I could never do that, right? So I don't get a pass. I'm not fucking exempt from going back. What's your triggers? Uh, grief, grief, um, sad, grief, like it loss. Um, I, I have respect. Sometimes I, uh, sometimes I take things as disrespect, you know, I'll keep it real with you. Um, I had the heater on at my house the other day, two nights ago, and it was freaking cold in the house. And my wife goes over and turns off the heater and I flipped out on her. And I was like, what are you doing? Like I'm fucking cold. Right. And I took that as a sign of disrespect. Like, hey, don't touch my shit and I'm not fucking with you. Don't fuck with me. But do you see how the insanity just, ugh, the monster goes? Yeah. yeah, I get like that as well when you're just arguing for, with people for no fucking reason. And I'm <laughs> nearly six years clean. So mm. I thought as soon as I eliminate all those, my life will be perfect. Oh, hell I'll be, no. I'll be peaceful. I still get angry. I still get road rage. I still think, fuck mm -hmm. me. I, I go running sometimes. See, when I go jogging in the hills, I think I could kill people and bury them <laughs> somewhere. It's fucking, it's insanity. I genuinely think I could, I could if I kill him, I could bury him there and nobody would ever know. That's my mind. And I had to speak to someone about mm -hmm. that because they're thinking, I used to think I was fucking crazy, but I bottled it up well. But then they say, that's okay. Everybody has thoughts, even the sweet old women to They have those thoughts as long as you're obviously not acting on them. Right. But people do get those visualization of fucking hurting people. And I think, man, 
Am I crazy? It's it, it's fucking nuts. So I, I'm glad you said that. I will say this: just you know, I'll say it to the viewers: just because you get sober does not mean it's going to be rainbows and butterflies for the rest of your life. Yeah, shit's going to happen. Life's going to happen. You're going to get a divorce, possibly. You're going to get in a fender bender, a car accident. Right? People are going to steal shit from you. Yeah. People are going to piss you off. Road rage. Life is going to fucking happen. But it's not the end of the world either that we get angry sometimes. I feel as if when you try to make changes and people come into your life as well, they try and eliminate all that from you. But it is who we are as well, that as long as you're not harming anyone, but you can get angry and people go, listen, you're doing that thing again, go and take a walker. They should know that your triggers as well where they should be able to maintain it. People don't have to accept it. If they're not happy, they can leave. But right. I feel as if as man as well, they're trying to cut away the masculinity and the the energy that we have because you're wrong you're doing this listen if you're making mistakes by all means you're fucking doing wrong but we ain't perfect correct we ain't fucking perfect we've got trauma we've got baggage we've got fucking i've never fought in wars or anything but i've seen a lot of destruction and right. pain i've been surrounded by a lot of murders and prisons and fucking bullshit where i'm from back in glasgow but it always affects you no matter how much money i make or how big this podcast comes i still never feel good enough sometimes i feel as if i'm doing everything wrong i could be doing more i try and do everything for everybody else but sometimes i don't do enough for me and that's what i kind of try to work on now i can have a good life i can still smile because i'm the guy if i'm laughing and smiling i love to have a laugh right but a negative will come in right, right, and right. say you shouldn't be happy and then i'll be sad all fucking day <laughs> yeah. and i'm so it's like nobody's I've no issues. It's my issues are here. Right. It's the voices here. Whatever program I've got, it's fucking wired up wrong. Obviously, if I was taking drugs and drink for years, oh god, yeah, it must be. It must do something to your receptors. Your, Definitely. Your your mind. I don't know. I believe the body does repair, but whether it fucking fully repairs is another level. Well, yeah, even pornography, it does something to your receptors. Yeah, yeah. Right? Darkens yeah. the amygdala, which makes you depressed. That is a depression. You're depressed if you watch porn. Yeah. And I watch porn from. 10 11 years old back in the day for many fucking years so you see women as objects as well <clears throat> because all the girlfriends and women i had back in the day it was all empty sex it never had any emotion or meaning it was nothing facts and that was a fucking horrible thing as well so i don't know where you just <laughs> if you just become so disconnected even if i have good things happen in my life i don't ever <laughs> celebrate it nothing really feels yeah. do you know what i mean it's not as if i'm numb because i have feelings and emotions i love animals i love my kids right. i love my family but Nothing really gets, I don't know if that's because I've damaged all the the neural pathways or the the dopamine levels where yeah. it's just, they're fucking not, they're fried. So I'm a huge advocate on that too, man. Trauma is trauma. And I say that a lot. You didn't have to go to war to have post-traumatic stress disorder. I'm huge on that, right? Because I want everybody to get better. People that are hurting to be a, a sexual assault victim, a car accident victim, any verbal abuse, physical abuse, any, anything mm -hmm. that caused trauma in your life that, right? But you, <laughs> you're right, man. Once you start uh, putting in the substances and messing with the receptors, and it, it just will go haywire, man. Mm -hmm. When are you at your happiest? With my daughter. My daughter gave me purpose. I was a. I was a lone lone missile. I was a lone ranger, a lone wolf, uh, prior to having my daughter. I could care less what happened to me prior. Now I have purpose. Mm -hmm. I have purpose and it's to provide for her and ultimately to show her morals, values, ethics, experience, hard work hard lessons um yeah this is my first go around at being a dad a father yeah, i don't want to mess it up it's tough man because kids need their dad kids need their dad because without the father figure as well there's a high person coming from the broken home and I always state this so people can get an understanding even for new listeners for anybody that comes from a broken home they're they're more likely to end up in prison oh yeah sex work addiction suicide just because they've not got that stable loving family. So then they, they end up in bad relationships and making bad choices because there's no structure, there's no discipline. We need discipline. No matter how tough or angry you can get, we still need a set of discipline for your kids to understand, look, don't do that. Don't make the same mistakes I'm done because I'm soft. 
mm-hmm. I'm a soft cunt so <laughs> uh, my kids <laughs> seem to get away with things and I know they shouldn't because I, listen life is tough out there as well you can't right. be fucking raising pansies you can't be raising soft children either and people might not like that and we should love our kids by all means but it's to do well on this life there's going to be a lot of people out there trying to destroy you no matter if you're good or bad mm-hmm. people have always got something to say positive or negative so it's just trying to learn them a healthier balance that people will test you just be ready don't be a punk just try and do the right things in life as well right so prior to becoming a father i thought those were going to be challenges obstacles for me one with my military experiences how the hell am i going to talk to my kid about what the hell happened over there but that's been fine she'll i haven't said anything and she'll ask me questions hey daddy were you in the army yeah and i'll just give her a little bit of nuggets right Mm -hmm. nothing crazy another thing is i'm working against social media i'm working against the news i'm working against propaganda what the schools are teaching but i don't feel like i'm competing against them she knows what's happening outside of the home and she knows what's happening you know as i'm raising her Mm -hmm. so that's a good thing um but it's been going good man oh and the third thing was i thought i was going to be too strict if i would have had a boy i would have been too strict for sure Mm -hmm. but i have a little girl i'm not too strict like you said i'm soft too man i let her paint my toenails (laughs) um because because you know i'm her dad Mm -hmm. she's my little girl she's my queen my princess and um she knows i protect the family yeah it's amazing because even though you don't want to die it's when you have a kid it gives you something to live for it took me many years to become a dad i was kind of all over the place with the partying i never really understood it because i wasn't ready mm-hmm. and then after a few years i realized they, they need me and that's one of the reasons why i made the changes you have to make changes for yourself but i'm i see that's the opposite for me with my son he kind of gets away with more my daughter really? i'm stricter especially because i know what men are like oh yeah yeah and my, my kids don't have sleepovers oh yeah fuck no. that shit man there's too many fucking no. pedophiles and creepy yeah, bastards yeah, there is. with cameras there is it's maybe not the mums and dads who they're around but it could be the brothers or the uncles oh. are coming in the house i've spoke to too many people to make me so paranoid and it's it's a good thing as well but they do fall out with me for that but that's okay as long as i know you're protected under my my house you're going to be safe so that was one of the worst things in prison reading the files of the pedophilers the child molesters it monsters i stopped reading them unfathomable things you can never imagine where do they do their time do they do it in like a protection unit they are they're in the protective custody they're right there with the gang dropouts with the rapists and what was it like work did you ever work in there yeah 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 absolutely 100 percent. is that a different energy again uh, if within me yeah i don't want to i don't want to be around them yeah. i don't want i don't like them right uh <laughs> yeah. nobody likes them nobody likes him so but the worst part is that we have to we have to protect them it's our job to protect them and i didn't like doing that but we had to to be a professional yeah how is that when you read somebody's for you when they've raped babies and sh- oh weird no shit like that? it's fucking uh it makes you it makes you physically ill yeah it makes you I'm, like I said, I stopped. I stopped reading them because you couldn't, you couldn't imagine. I couldn't tell you some of the shit. You probably wouldn't even believe me, and I wouldn't even tell you because I wouldn't want to pollute your mind with with what I've read, mm-hmm. what's out there. Who do you think's the most dangerous prisoners in prison? Is it the quiet ones, or is it the the murderers, or is it the gangbangers? <clears throat> was there any mafia in? Oh yeah, there's mafia for sure. But the quiet <laughs> ones, quiet ones are always the worst ones, man. The, the ones that are loud and talking shit are, are like, I mean, you know what's going to happen. You put a hand on them, they're going to cry or whatever. The ones that are quiet, they're the motherfuckers that will kill you. Mm-hmm. They'll fucking kill you in a heartbeat. Was there any prison officers got killed? 2005. In Chino. Um, Officer Gonzalez. Stabbed. What happened to the guy who stabbed him? There's a death penalty? Inmate Blaylock. He has been bouncing around the state of California in ad sex. I think currently he's in Lancaster State Prison. He's been in the hole since he killed him in 2005. Nearly 20 years? Yeah, yeah. Nearly 20 years in the hole in ad seg, administrative segregation. 
you know, I don't know if it's, uh, what do you call it, um, retaliation for killing a police officer or a correctional officer or just, yeah, I mean, it's not my problem anymore, but dangerous individual. How bad is the prison system now that you're speaking out against it? Do you have, and also, could your life be in danger that you'd speak out against the corruption in these systems? Because it's a big money-making scheme. At back in the UK, it's 40 or 50 grand per year per inmate. It's slavery. So I, I resigned. I resigned. I submitted my letter of resignation. I quit. The, the honor, the proper, like I said, I do everything with honor. I walked out the front door. I handed it to the warden and said, I'm done. Nobody does that. No, I had 11, 12 more years to go until my until I could retire. Pension. I have pension at 50. So now I have to wait 11 years because I'm 39. When I turn 50, I could collect my pension. But uh, I pulled a fast one on them. I pulled a fast one on them because I left the department. Then I started a YouTube channel. Then I started staring out all these stories. I know for a fact they don't like it, but I don't trust my government. I don't trust our leaders. They can make something up and put it on me and say, oh, look at this guy did this, this, and the other. And it will be up to me to have to fight for my freedom. Mm -hmm. Am I afraid of my life, safety? I don't think they wouldn't, they wouldn't kill me or put my life in danger. They will fuck me over in the, with the system. I, I, I don't put that past him. How bad is the corruption within the prison system? Obviously, you've seen it firsthand, but how deep does it go? It, it goes past the governor. They're getting their orders from somewhere. And the reason I say that is because when I left, I talked to three, I don't know if they were Senate, Senate people or Congress people. I get the two mixed up. One's for the, the other one's for the state. And um, I told three of them what was happening. And they said, oh, okay, we'll get back to you later. They never got back to me. So I know that they probably told somebody, hey, I'm, I'm in contact. And they probably just said, leave that alone. Don't touch that. Because what happens is when you speak out against the system, they're very good at discrediting you, saying things, news, maybe a news article, he's a drug addict, he's an alcoholic, yeah. crashes his car, he's a violent man. Right, right. So when you say things, people don't really give it as much importance. But again, it's people know now, when people get discredited, it's because they're saying something right. <laughs> when yeah. people get cancelled, it's because they've said the right. right stuff. Do you know what I mean? So it's just a big game. What do you think life is? And now that you're seeing it differently? As a 39-year-old man, father, combat veteran, I see life as a journey. I see life as a journey. We're put here on earth, you know. I'm not, I'm not a Bible thumper. I'm not a religious man where I'm going to force my beliefs onto you. But I believe we're here for a reason. There's good and evil in this world. I've seen both. Sometimes they walk hand to hand. And I believe in helping people. I believe in people should help other people, especially when they're at their lowest and hurting the most. <clears throat> what do they say? Every sinner has a future. Every saint has a past. So just because you were one way at a certain time doesn't you know, write you off for the rest of your life. And just because you think you're too good and that you can't make a mistake or... or, or fall short oh that could definitely happen that's what i think life is it's a journey where do you go forward for the future i just want to provide i've always wanted to provide i just want to provide for my family <laughs> right now my wife and i are not seeing eye to eye because i i have this passion i have this momentum i have what i have is momentum right now and i cannot slow down <clears throat> she doesn't want that she, I don't know if it makes her feel uncomfortable. She kind of, she wants to stay in that comfort zone, but I got to surpass it. I want to provide. I want to provide the best for my daughter, whatever it may be, a better home. I mean, we live in a beautiful home, but I, I want more, right? Hmm. More ism. Yeah, but again, that's addictive personality, right. addictive nature. Right. For me, family is home. Family is perfection. <laughs> family is everything. But again, same as me, I'm traveling the world as well away from my kids when i talk about loving my kids and doing this everything's for my kids but apart it's still doing it for myself because i still need to keep busy I, I can't settle at home because it's this right it's this fucking i'm not a good person when i'm sitting around and fucking doing nothing i've got to keep active that's who i am will it ever change I don't, I don't know but my kids are happy they're healthy they're doing great things 
I'm a good father, I'm a protective father, but for me, I will only do this for a few more years and then give my family every bit of time I have just to travel the world and do everything's memories. Life goes so fast, so I don't have it all figured out, but I, the path that I'm trying to create is, is on the right path anyway. I'm not hurting anybody, I'm doing my thing, but I just hope, obviously I hope you and your missus can sort it anyway, because like I say, for your daughter coming from that stable home is everything. But sometimes that addictive nature, we're always trying to test the waters and push the boundaries. <laughs> and why will we do that? Nobody's still ever happy. Do you know what I mean? So we're always thinking, but I'm sober and I'm this. We use that as an excuse. But people just want is, listen, you don't need to do all that. We're here, but we're living happy. But there's also something in here where we're still men, we're still warriors, we're still nature to go and try and push the boundaries and just always test the waters. You know? Facts. How do you feel telling your story today? Feel great, man. Feel great. You know, I didn't know which direction we were going to take it. And once we got the, uh, <clears throat> I like diving into the good, nitty gritty, deep stuff, man. Yeah. That's where I feel transparent. That's where I feel comfortable. That's where the gold is, though. This is not just for me and you. These are therapy sessions. I was just talking shit. But it's for the listeners, the viewers to go, f I feel that way. Right. He made changes. Fuck, say he's sober, but he's still having relationship problems. Facts. We're not, sh we're not sh built to be perfected and not bulge around perfection it doesn't exist and, and you brought that out of me right it's it's the person that's interviewing me that we're talking that we're conversing with is i never really brought up relationship issues with any other podcast kind of just walk around like i got my shit together but it's getting really bad you know especially this flight over here to um new york mm -hmm. and i i kind of say like hey i'm doing this to provide i'm doing this to provide but there's still got to be an element of understanding as well that right support you need a support network Correct. you don't need in a sore head as well i don't know the situation because mm -hmm. you could be talking pure shit you could be an absolute fucking loon ball when she's scared or whatever do you know what i mean or it could be you're trying to do the best thing she's just concerned that you're not giving the family enough time right but it's a constant battle right but i think that's just relationships on a whole mm -hmm. same as my own relationships I'm in a great place. People think I'm a fucking great guy, but I'm also <laughs> get angry and get upset and, and fucking and go off my mind from fucking time to time. But, but that's every person. My grandma does that. My mum does that. My sister does that. Mm -hmm. Everybody loses their shit from time to time. But as long as you can rein it in, admit your guilt and just go, okay, listen, I'm sorry. Then I'll work at that. And um, you're right. right. But there's got to be an understanding as well. There's got to be communication communication and, and support everything's to do with support i support you do you know what if that's what you want to do i'll support you just make sure you're safe make sure obviously you're not drinking or whatever because because of the shit you've done everybody will be on edge as well that you're coming here or you're moving because they don't know if you're fucking drinking or you're lying or whatever it is mm -hmm. because we're always going to be those cannons yeah do you know what i mean right for anybody watching brother that's in a life of struggle right now what advice would you have for them Reach out for help. Don't be so damn stubborn. Reach out for help. Ask, you know, hey, and don't give up. Don't give up as far as if you go to one therapist and you don't like what they say, go to another one. Don't quit the fucking process. Mm -hmm. Work at it day after day after day and be selfless, not selfish. Promote your own stuff as well, brother. Your YouTube channel, your Instagram. Is that your own clothing range? Yeah, these hats just got made. They just got made, Hector Bravo. Um, you can find the link at my YouTube channel, That Prison Guard. That Prison Guard. I go under Hector Bravo. Instagram, Hector underscore underscore Bravo. And what you'll see daily is me putting out this same mission, uh, mission statement, same message. Mm -hmm. Would you like to finish up on anything else, brother? I just want to thank you for giving me this opportunity, man. We made it happen coming from two different places. And this is one of the freaking, if not the best um, conversations, man, because we got deep, dude. Yeah. And, and I know you understand for sure. I can tell that you understand the struggle. Yeah, the struggle is real, brother. But yeah. also the change is real. People can make better choices. People can make better decisions. You can kick on in life, but it doesn't make you immune to pain because it always problems and pain and situations are always going to arise but when you're in a clean state of frame of mind you just handle them better mm -hmm. you don't have to get as angry and upset all the time I give a fall out with the missus to then go and drink again everything I fell out with people was an excuse I created arguments because it gave me an excuse to drink or go and gamble it was just that was me it was a fucking idiot you know what I mean <laughs> Right. But everything you promoted everything as well brother your book as well where can people get your book uh, on Amazon Operation Yard Recall by Hector Bravo. 
it's a good prison. Uh, it's a good book on the uh, experiences working in the prison. Hector, listen, I thoroughly enjoyed your story, mate. I'm proud of you as well. 13 years. Thank you. And I look forward to Likewise. seeing what you do for the future. Thank you, brother. God bless you, brother. Cool.